Okay, so it is uh, my pleasure to introduce the second lecture, Zakhar Kablushka, please. Yes, and many thanks for inviting me to give a talk here. It's a great pleasure to do it. Uh, the title of the first lecture is Annuals as Probabilities, and there is a paper by Feldman and Klein with the same title, uh, which explains things very nicely and which influenced this lecture. So probably everybody knows that the sum of, an, of angles in a triangle is constant, and it equals one half of the full solid angle. So we shall measure all angles as proportions of the full solid angle. But not so well known is the behavior of angles of a tetrahedron. So what is the sum of angles in a tetrahedron? I mean sum of solid angles. Um, it is not constant. So is, it is not constant. And in this connection, several questions appear. For example, one may ask, what is the minimal value of the angles over the sum of the angles or the maximal value? Or what is the mean value if the tetrahedron or more generally simplex is random? And we shall try to answer some of these questions. So let us start with the definition. We shall consider a simplex, simplex in the d-dimensional space. And it is a convex hull of d plus one points. So the dimension of the space is d and we take d plus one points. And the convex hull is the set of all convex combinations of these points. So y1 uh, from zero to d and all lambda i are non-negative and the sum of the lambda i's is one. And sometimes it is convenient to require these points to be a finally independent, which means that they are not in a common hyperplane. They are not connect, con contained in a common hyperplane. So, uh, sorry. Finally independent. And now let me define what I mean by angles. First, I will define angles at vertices. So we need a notation for a bow. Rd will be denoted by b of some, po some point x which is the center of the ball and radius r. And this is the set of all points y having distance at most r from x. And now given a simplex, we can define the internal angle at vertex xi. So these points x0, xz are the vertices of the simplex and the internal angle is defined, it is denoted by beta of xi is a vertex and s is a simplex. And it is defined as follows. We take a, a point and we imagine that we sit at this point and look in some direction. And there are directions which look inside the simplex and directions which look outside. And now we measure the proportion of all directions which look inside, that's the idea. So we take the volume, the d-dimensional volume of the ball centered at xi with radius epsilon, intersected with s, and divided by the volume of the ball centered at xi with radius epsilon. So we take here a ball, and take this intersection, take its volume, and then divide it by the volume of the whole ball. And now if epsilon is sufficiently small, this quantity stays constant. And in particular, it converges. So one could, could take here the limit. And this proportion is called the internal angle. The units of measurement are here such that the full angle, the angle of the full space would be one, and the angle of a half space would be one, one half, for example. And now let us state the first theorem, which has at the first sight nothing to do with probability, and it determines the maximal possible value of the angle sum in a simplex. So for every simplex we have that the sum of the angles 
its vertices is at most one half. It can be equal to one half, but only in the plane. So for d greater or equal than three, this is a strict inequality. And for d equals two, it is equality. And now let us prove this theorem by using a probabilistic method. So we need first a lemma. This lemma gives an interpretation of angles as probabilities, and in the following we shall use it or use similar ideas very many times. So it's a lemma about angles as probabilities. Let S be a simplex. And let U be a uniformly distributed random vector on the unit sphere in this d-dimensional space. So it is uniformly distributed. And let U orthogonal complement be the orthogonal complement of this vector. So it is the set of all, sorry, it is the set of all X in RD which are orthogonal to u. So u orthogonal is just a uniformly distributed random hyperplane of dimension d minus one. And let us denote by pi or by pi u orthogonal, the orthogonal projection to this hyperplane. So it is a orthogonal projection to this hyperplane. And then we claim the following. First of all, we need a notation for the angle sum at vertices. Let me denote this angle sum by sigma zero of S, zero because we take it the sum at vertices and in a moment we shall define it for, for any faces. And the lemma states the following. Then the angle sum is equal to the, to the, to the probability that the projection of the simplex, which is now in the d minus one dimensional hyperplane, is a d minus one dimensional simplex. Now in this formula, there is a mistake and your task is to find this mistake. We shall see. <laughs> so the proof of the lemma. First of all, there are the following possibilities. Let me draw a, a picture in the three-dimensional space. So we have a tetrahedron here with four vertices, d is equal to three. And then there are two possibilities. We project it onto a plane, which is random and uniformly distributed. And there are two possibilities. The first possibility is, or maybe it is the second possibility, is that the projection is a triangle. And since we have four points which we project, this means that one of the points each is projected into the convex hull of the other three points, like here. So this is pi s, this is s, and this is our projection. And this is the plane. The second possibility is that the projected points are in convex position, which is shown here. Then we have four points which are in convex position, which means that none of them is in the convex hull of the others. Right? And of course, there are also degenerate cases when, for example, two points project to the same place, but let us ignore these degenerate cases because they have probability zero. So we have two possibilities and the probability which is here pi s is a simplex is the second possibility, right? So this is, this is possibility two. Now, um, so um, I don't know whether I have to write it down. So, okay, there are two possibilities. First, pi x zero and so on pi x d are in convex position. And second, um, pi s is a simplex with d vertices. 
And now let us try to compute the probability of the second possibility. So let us take some of the vertices, say x0, and compute the probability that pi of x0 is contained in the convex hull of all other points. So it is contained in the convex hull of pi x1 until pi xd. What is this probability? What do you think? One can, so we re recall that we take a tetrahedron or a simplex and project it into, in a random direction. And how, how, what are directions for which we observe this possibility? And it's, I will not prove it exactly, but it seems natural that if we project, if we take this point and project in a direction which looks inside the simplex, then this point will be projected into the convex hull of the others point. One can show triggers, right? And so the probability that we have such a projection is the angle at vertex zero. And now we can do this the same for any vertex. So for example, we can write similarly for the vertex xi, I can write, this is the probability that pi xi is contained in the convex hull of, of the other points, of, of, of the projections of the other point, that points. So it is pi x0, pi xi excluded, and pi xd. Now we can take the sum over all i, and then we get the angle sum of the simplex is the probability that two occurs. So is the probability of this second possibility, right? That one of the points is inside the convex hull of the others. And this proves our formula because two is exactly the statement that pi s is a d-dimensional, is, is a d minus one dimensional simplex. Right, so we proved the formula. Was the proof so convincing that you didn't see the mistake? <laughs> so anybody? Uh, maybe if you project in an opposite Sorry. direction, mm -hmm. you also will have uh, the same picture. I don't understand, sorry. So if, um, if the vector um, is in an opposite direction, not inside, uh, but distances, outside, but yeah, yeah, like that. Exactly. So there is another possibility. I said here that in order to have one point or point x0 inside the projection of the others or inside the convex hull of the projection of the others, we need to, um, to project inside the simplex. But we could also take the opposite directions here and it will be the same. So we have here a factor of two, which is missing. Um, factor of two, two is missing here. And similarly, a factor of two is missing here. And similarly, we have two here, which means here we have one half. And so this lemma gives an interpretation for the angle sum at vertices first of the simplex as the probability that the projection of the simplex is again a simplex times one half. And now from the lemma, it's very easy to deduce the maximal value of the angle sum, namely a corollary, the angle sum of the simplex is always smaller or equal than one half. And this follows from the fact that the probability is always smaller than one because the angle sum is one half times some probability. Now, um, one can ask whether the bounds zero, which is trivial, so zero is here and one half are sharp in some sense. And it's easy to, cons or let me construct cases in which these bounds are attained, at least in the limit. So first, 
the case when the angle sum becomes arbitrarily small. How to achieve this? Well, let's see. Let's take here three points in the plane. And the, the so these are, uh, I'm sorry, these are, these are x1, x2, x3. And the last point should be such that any projection of the simplex, any projection on any plane is not a simplex. And to achieve this, we can just take x0 to be very close to this plane and converge him to some point on this plane. So if x0 converges to some point on this plane, such that this is, these points are in convex po position, these four points, then in any projection, they will be in convex position. If we exclude degenerate cases as always, and this is never going to be a simplex. So the angle sum of such a simplex goes to zero. This is one example. And the other example is when the angle sum goes to one half. To have this, we need a construction in which the projection is almost always a triangle, right? So a simplex such that its projection is almost always a triangle. And we can achieve this by taking a triangle, three points, and then let the last point converge to some point inside this triangle. So it's again a de degenerate case. It's a case of some degeneration. And if, if the last point is here inside the triangle, then of course, any projection will have the same property that in any projection it stays inside the triangle. And uh, therefore the probability is one and the angle sum goes to one half. So this determines the maximal and the minimal, minimal value of the angle sum. And by continuity, one can argue that by continuity, any value between zero and one half can be attained. Okay. Now, um, are there any questions maybe at this point? Any questions? No. Okay, so, uh, so far we considered angle sums at vertices. Now it is possible to define more general angle sums, namely angle sums at any face of a polytop. So let me define all these more general concepts and then one can apply similar ideas to these more general settings. So first of all, a polytop is a convex hull of finitely many points. Convex hull of finitely many points in Rd. So P is convex hull of x1, xn. Now in a fine hyperplane, so probably you know these definitions, in a fine hyperplane is a set of solutions to a linear inequality, a linear equality. So H is the set of solutions X to an inequality of the form XY scalar product is equal to S, where Y is some non-zero vector and S is a real number. And given a hyperplane, one can define two half spaces. H plus and H minus. H plus is defined in the same way, but with greater than S and H minus is defined in the same way, but with smaller or equal to S. So if this is H, then one of these half spaces is H plus and the other one is H minus. And now an alternative definition of the polytop, the mark, a polytop is an alternative, uh, alternative, alternatively an intersection of finitely many half spaces. 
of finitely many half spaces. But an intersection of finitely many half spaces could be something like that. It could be unbounded. So only if it is bounded. So a bounded intersection of finitely many half spaces is a polytope. Now let us define the faces of the polytope. So um, the faces of the polytope are defined as follows. First, we need the definition of a supporting hyperplane. Supporting hyperplane of a polytope P is a hyperplane H such that H is contained in one of the half space, uh, P is contained in one of the half spaces generated by this hyperplane. So P is in H plus and P intersects H plus non trivially. So for example, if this is a polytop, P, then this is a supporting hyperplane or this is a supporting hyperplane or this one intersects and the polytop is on one side of this hyperplane. And now a face of a polytop definition face of P is just an intersection of P with some supporting hyperplane. So it's P intersected with a supporting hyperplane where H, H is a supporting hyperplane. And now there are many sorts of faces, for example, so any face is a convex set and one can define the dimension of this convex set. Zero dimensional faces are vertices, one dimensional faces are edges and so on. And so on and D minus one dimensional faces are closed facets. Zahar. Yes. А можно тебя попросить не сдвигать сразу наверх страницу, а по возможности донизу писать, чтобы побольше информации перед глазами сохранялось? Ну или или чуть-чуть уменьшить? That's, that's difficult because I, I have a hand there. <laughs> okay, I will try. A cold facets and and uh, the only d-dimensional face is p itself. Am I too quick or? Okay. Too quick or? No, but but now uh, when uh, you rescaled it, is the, there are much more information uh, before our eyes. So I think it's better. Yes, so like this. Well, yes. I think it's fine. I think it's fine uh, until you move in something unknown. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so far we are going in the familiar universe. Yes, well, okay. So let us introduce the notation. A of P is the set of a dimensional faces and FK of P is their number. Number, K dimensional faces. And now let us define angles at faces. So here is a definition for a face F of P. We do the following. We take some point Z or Y, Y in the relative interior of F which means that y is contained in f but not in a face of smaller dimension so y is in f but not in a face of smaller dimension so for example if the face is a, an interval then we exclude these boundary points and y is inside if the Face is some polygon, then we exclude the boundary, the relative boundary, and y is strictly 
in inside. Well, and now given such point Y, we do the following. We imagine that we sit at the point Y and the, that we are very small and we look in any in all directions. And so some directions show inside the polytop. Some of directions show outside the polytop. And we count those directions which show inside and take their probability. So the internal angle of P at its face F at F is defined as follows, beta of F inside P is, again, it is the volume in dimension D of the ball with center Y, which is this point in the relative interior and with radius epsilon intersected with P. These are, so to say, directions which look inside divided by the set of all, by the volume of all directions. And again, if Y is large, this may be strange, but if Y gets smaller, this quotient at some point doesn't change anymore. It stays constant. And so if we take Y to zero, then it stays constant at some point, and this is called the angle at phase F. For example, a very simple special case is that for a phase of dimension of dimension d minus one, and recall our polytop is that is in dimension d, and I also assume that it has dimension d, so it is non-degenerate non for convenience. Then for a phase of dimension d minus one, the angle, the internal angle at this phase is what? So for example, here in dimension two, imagine we sit here, this is our phase, and then we sit here. And then we look at in all possible directions, and exactly one half of these directions show inside the polytop. Show it, so it is it is one half. But the other angles are more complicated. And now um, let us define the cave angle sum. So cave angle sum of a polytop P. So any convex polytop of dimension D is defined as follows. Sigma K of P is the sum overall faces. So overall faces F of dimension K of P of beta of F in P. So I take all faces of dimension K, K is fixed and K is zero until say D minus one. And we take all phases of, of fixed dimension and take all angles, all internal, internal angles at these phases and take the sum. So this is called the kth angle sum. We consider the zeroth angle sum in the previous theorem. And now um, what is known about these angle sums? There is a very nice relation, so theorem, it's called the Gram relation for these angle sums. And it says the following, for every polytop P, for every convex polytop P of dimension D, of dimension D, we have S0 of P minus S, uh, not S0, I called it sigma zero, I'm sorry. So sigma zero, minus sigma one P plus sigma two of P minus and so on, plus minus the last one, which is sigma D minus one of P is minus one to the power D minus one. So the alternating sum of these angle sums is minus one or plus one. Um, and let us give a probabilistic proof of this theorem. Um, namely, the theorem looks very much like the Euler relation for the numbers of vertices, or for the numbers of phases in a polytop. And if, uh, as such, it should be deduced from this Euler relation, and we shall do it. So let us prove a lemma first. 
a probabilistic lemma. So the proof is going to be probabilistic. Um, let P be a polytope. So let P be a polytope. Full dimension D, and let let U be uniformly distributed direction on the unit sphere in this space, and let pi be orthogonal projection on the orthogonal complement of U. Then there is an interpretation of the case angle sum of P as follows. It is one half times the number of faces of P minus the expected number of faces in dimension K of the projection of P. So we take P itself and take its projection in a random direction. And we the projection is random for for this random projection, we can compute the expected number of k faces, k dimensional faces, and we compare, compare it to the expected number of faces of the polytope itself. And the difference is two times the angle sum. This is the interpretation. Now, let us prove, uh, and okay, and this holds for k equals zero to d minus two, and the case d minus one is not interesting because the corresponding angle sum is just this uh, trivial sum of one half. So just for completeness, oh, sorry. Mm. Yes, so for completeness, a remark, the D minus first angle sum is just one half times the number of facets. So it is, one half times the number of facets of P because every angle at a facet is one half. And now let us prove the lemma. The problem is that I cannot write in such a way that, <laughs> that it stays above because otherwise I throw some buttons here and I touch them and some programs start. Yeah, so I just I cannot uh, stop. If it is possible, if it's not, so don't do it. So um, let us take some face. So take take some face f of dimension k, and let us look at the projection of this face in the project polytop. So we take the polytop and we project it in a random direction, right? And the projection is again a convex polytop and it has faces. And all these faces must be projections of the faces of the original polytop. But not every face of the original polytop projects to a face of a projected polytop. So for example, if you project in this way, right? Then there are some faces which project to faces and some faces which project to something inside. And so let us take a face and let us look at the probability that PF is not a face of pi P. So we have some face F and this face is destroyed by projection. What is this probability? So um, imagine we sit inside this face F and we project in some direction. For which directions is the projection such that the projected face is destroyed, such that this face is destroyed by projection? Well, it's again the same answer. So it's not maybe not quite trivial to prove it rigorously, but I think the intuition should be that if our direction of in which we project looks inside the polytop, then the face is destroyed, like here. So for example, I take this face and I project in this direction, it looks inside and this face is destroyed in the projection. It projects in the, in the interior. And here for this face, we project in, in a direction which looks outside and here the same. But there is also again a factor of two 
Namely, it is possible that, for example, here we project in this direction. And it's again the same, right? So all these directions will destroy the phase and all the directions here will are also going to destroy it. So this is, I think it should be plausible at least that this is two times the angle at this phase, right? Because the angle counts all those projections, all those directions which look inside and there are also the opposite directions, which, which is why we have a two here. Now let us take the complementary event. One minus P that pi F is a phase, the projected polytop is two times the angle. So I just take, I have just written this probability as one minus the complementary probability. And now we take the sum over all phases. This is true for every phase and sum over all F, over all K dimensional phase. So if we sum these ones, we get just the number of phases. And if we sum all these probabilities, so we take the probability that PF, the phase PF survives after this projection. And then we take, we can write it as say the expectation of the indicator function of, of the sum, because we take the sum here, P, that the indicator function that PRF is a phase of phi P. Right, because I, I've just written the probability at the expectation of the indicator function and here is the sum. And on the right hand side, we just have the, we just have two times the cave angle sum of this polytop. And now the last step is to observe that what we have here, it just counts the faces of the projected polytop. So, we take all P pi f's and look where every face of the project polytop must be of the form pi f. So what is here is just the expected number of is the expected number of faces of dimension k of the project polytop, and this is two sigma k p. So we proved the lemma, and remember. This lemma, this lemma expresses the cave angle sum of a polytop as well as the f vector of its of itself minus the expected f vector of its projection. And now let us prove the Gram Euler relation. Recall it says that the alternating sum of these angle sums is minus one. Well, so proof of the gram Euler relation. Um, we write the Euler relation. For the polytop P. Well, for the polytop P, the Euler relation says that the alternating sum of the phase numbers is zero. So F zero of P minus F one of P plus F2 of P minus and so on. And the last term is FD minus one of P is equal to zero or two depending on, so it's the Euler characteristic of a polytop, it's zero or two depending on whether D minus one is integer or, or is odd or even. Uh, so this is the relation for the polytop itself, but we can do it also for the project polytop. It's a D minus one dimensional polytop. So for this one, we have that F zero of pi P minus F one of pi P plus and so on. And then plus minus the last one, which is in this case F D minus two of P because it is D minus one dimensional and not of P pi P is one plus minus one to the power D minus two. Now we can take the expectation in the second sum. 
because it's random. So we have y p minus one y p plus and so on plus minus f d minus two of pi p, and this is equal to one plus minus one to the power d minus two. And then we just subtract these two equalities. So we subtract this one and this one. And we get, what do we get? We get F0 minus expected number, expect F0 of the projection. But by the lemma, it is two times the angle sum. Uh, by the lemma here, if we take here k equals zero, then f0 minus expected f0 is two times the angle sum. So if in the first row we get zero's angle sum of p minus. Now we subtract this from that. And again, we have f1 minus expected f1 of the projection. So it is two times sigma, sigma one of p and so on. So in this case, we, we represented the, expected, the angle sums, right? We, the angle sum is just a difference of two f's. And so the, the alternating sum of these sigmas is just a combination of two alternating sums of f's and both satisfy the Euler relation. This is the idea of this proof. And then at the very end, one has to be more careful here. So at the very end, we get here fd minus 2 minus this fd minus 2 is sigma um, d minus 2. And here we have just fd minus 1 minus 0, but the last angle sum is fd minus 1 divided by 2. So at the very end, we have, I'm sorry, we have plus minus plus plus minus sigma d minus one of p times two. And this is, well, this is this minus that. One minus one is zero, and this is two times minus one to the power d minus one. So we are done, right? Because we just, we can just divide by two. And then we get the Gram-Euler relation, if I stated it correctly, let's check. Yes, I think it's exactly this one. So this gives a proof of the Gram-Euler relation by such, well, probabilistic means. By representing angles or angle sums as probabilities of certain events. Now, uh, some comments on, on this, maybe the first comment is that for simplicial polytops, so for polytops of which, which have all faces all of all of phases of these polytops are simplices, uh, there are more relations. So for simplicial polytops, there are more relations, linear relations for the F vectors and these can be translated into relations for the angles. So there are more relations for the angle sums. And the second remark is that the very same idea elaborated a little bit, namely this lemma here, this, this lemma can be used to obtain the minimal and the maximal value of this sigma k. And this has been done by Grun in 1993 and by Kepard in 1976. So they determined the maximal and the minimal values of the of the angle sums of a simplex for every k. So for example, the maximal value is one half d over k, and the minimum is some non-trivial bound, which I will not write. 
And the, the idea they use is very similar. One takes a simplex, and for a simplex, this number is known. It's just so the number of k dimensional phases is just a binomial coefficient because any subset of the vertices of k plus one vertices is such a phase. And the question is only what happens here. So here we project a simplex onto a random d minus one dimensional space, and the projection is a polytop in this subspace, which has one more vertex than a simplex. So it may be a simplex is this, this additional vertex is inside, but otherwise it has one more vertex. And the structure of such polytops is known. So it is known what are the possible f vectors of these polytops. And using this, they could obtain bound, which are also sharp on, on these numbers and find the minimal and the maximal values of these angle sums. It's interesting that this angle sum, sum the second, or that the minimum is not always zero. So we, I've seen in the case of the tetrahedron that the minimum was zero, but in general, it may be positive for other cases. Now, um, uh, in the remaining part of this lecture, I want to say something about the projections of polytops, and I hope that we will be able to deal with this topic in more detail later. Of polytops. So we have seen here that the angles of polytops have can be expressed in terms of such projections. And we project it here on hyperplanes. So on hyperplanes of dimension d minus of on linear subspace of dimension d minus one. But one can project on any linear subspaces. And this has also interpretation in terms of phases and so on. So let me define the notion of projections we will be interested in. So our next, next goal is to take a polytop and to project it in a random way. And then we shall prove various relations for these projections on, or we, can, we shall compute, for example, the number of phases in the projection, the expected number of phases. So let me first define some notions, G of N, D. So now we, we will be in the n-dimensional space, not in the d-dimension, in the n-dimensional space. And G and D is the set of d-dimensional linear subspaces, subspaces of Rn. So it's a Grassmannian. And random element, random element of G and D. So a random d-dimensional subspace is uniformly distributed if this is the definition, if it remains invariant or if its distribution, random element, I call it L, if its distribution stays invariant under all under all rotations, under all orthogonal transformations. So the, if I take any fixed rotation or orthogonal transformation O and then rotate this L by this O, it, it should not change the distribution. So this is for all, for all orthogonal transformations O from Rn to Rn. But this is a, indirect definition and we can give in fact we can give an explicit construction which is convenient this explicit construction is as follows just take n1 and so on nd to be iid gaussian random vectors in this n dimensional space right Mm. and take their linear, their linear half. So L, uh, sorry, L defined as the linear half of this N1 and D is uniform on the Grossmannian. So just take Gaussian vectors, D of them, they are going to be linearly independent with probability one, and their linear hull is uniformly distributed because one can easily check that the condition is satisfied, that the 
rotation invariance is satisfied by the properties of the Gaussian distribution. And now let us introduce the following definition. Definition, let P be a polytop of maximal dimension N and let L be uniform on the Grassmannian dimensional subspace as above. Then we can consider two types of projections or two types of random projection. The first one is the uniform projection. The uniform projection of P is, is just pi, P where pi is the orthogonal projection on L. So pi P where pi from Rn to L is the orthogonal projection to L. So we just choose a, a, un, a linear subspace uniformly at random and project P onto this linear subspace. And the second sort of projections is the Gaussian projection. We denote it by GP, and here G is a matrix. So G is an operator or a matrix from Rn to Rd. So I want the projection to be d dimensional in both cases. The polytop is n dimensional and the projection is d dimensional. And by the way, let me assume always that n greater than d. So we project onto a smaller dimensional space. And here in the Gaussian projection, G is a Gaussian matrix, Gaussian random, random matrix, which means in this case that the entries of this G are IID standard Gaussian random variables. So the entries, it's not quadratic, it's from Rn to Rd. And GIG, the entries are IID and standard normal random variables. So now there are two sorts of projections. Uh, for example, the Gaussian projection, one may ask why is it so, why is it interesting? But there is a nice example of Gaussian projection if S is a regular simplex. So if S is the regular simplex, which is defined as the convex hull of the standard orthonormal basis in Rn. It's not full dimensional, but well, let's allow this for a moment. So it um, is a regular complex. Then Gs is Gs is, well, it is the convex hull of Ge1, G E n. And what is G E1? I think it is just the first column of the matrix of G. So these are just the columns of the matrix and they are, they consist of IID Gaussian random variables. So the columns are Gaussian, stunt Gaussian random points in RD. So here, G, uh, so here G E1, G, E, N are IID and standard Gaussian in RD. So this polytop is just a convex hull of N standard Gaussian random points. And it's, it, is, it is called the Gaussian polytop. So we take N Gaussian points in RD the convex hull. And this is called the Gaussian polytop. The Gaussian polytop is an example of a Gaussian projection in the very simple case when P is the simplex. And now there is a nice result and somewhat unexpected due to Baryshnikov and Vitale. That the expected number of faces for both random projections is the same. So our, our question maybe is to determine the expected number of faces of dimension K of 
these projections k of gp and this result of Baruchin of Vitalia states that for every polytope p these two numbers are equal so the expected number of faces in any dimension of the Gaussian projection is the same as for the uniform projection and moreover these two random variables fk of both projections have the same distribution in fact now we have 25 minutes okay so i see that <laughs> i was too quick but now the idea of proof so i, I will just explain the the idea not not the whole proof so let us take rn and let us take the kernel of g so g is a gaussian matrix from rn to rd maybe uh, rd has smaller dimension so i will i will represent it as something of smaller dimension and the kernel of g is a random subspace here and we claim we claim that the kernel of G is uniformly distributed. This follows from the properties of the Gaussian matrix. One can take the Gaussian matrix and multiply it from left or for, from right by orthogonal matrices, and the result is again a Gaussian matrix by the properties of the Gaussian distribution. And using this, it's easy to check that the kernel of a Gaussian matrix is uniformly distributed. So kernel of G is uniformly distributed on the Grassmannian of n minus d dimensional subspace because we map from n to d so the kernel has dimension n minus d so let us take the orthogonal complement of this kernel and then the orthogonal complement is also uniform but now on the Grassmannian of d dimensional subspace it has dimension d And so when comparing the Gaussian projection to the uniform projection, let us use as a model for the uniform projection, the projection onto this kernel. So let, let pi, sorry, let pi be this projection, projection to this kernel, then it is uniform. It is a, it is a uniform, projection and now we have the following commutative diagram so we take a polytope p and we project it and this is the uniform projection to the space l and on the other hand we can apply to this polytope the map g and the result is gp rd so we can we can project it this is p and this is pi p and on the other hand i can map it to to this gp and now clearly since uh, we have and, and now we have here one project uh, the first projection is in l and the second one is in rd but these two spaces are isomorphic by means of g because what is this orthogonal complement it's the factor space in fact right and since the kernel is outside there g restricted to this orthogonal complement is an isomorphism it, it's a it's a non-singular linear map so it's a map without kernel so g between these two spaces maybe between l and rd there is a map g and it is non-singular and this diagram is commutative because if you project here, then we lose something from the kernel, but then G maps kernel to zero. So this commutative, which means that these two polytops, these two projections are mapped to each other. They are just the same up to a non-singular linear transformation. And if I have a polytop and I apply to it a non-singular transformation, 
then the resulting polytope will have the same number of the same combinatorial type. It will have the same number of is going to have the same number of a dimensional phase, for example. And so we have the equality because these two polytopes, these two projections differ by a non-singular, by a random non-singular linear map. And so we proved that they are equal in distribution. Well, um, in the, so if we want to determine one of these quantities, we can try to use methods similar to what we have done. Namely, we can try to take a polytop P and let us now consider the uniform projection. So let us take a polytop P and let us consider a uniform projection, uniform random projection. I'm sorry, Zahar, I have a small question. Yes. Did, did we actually prove much more than you claimed? Did we prove that two mappings, are, the results of two mappings are linearly isomorphic? Yes, they are linearly isomorphic by some, um, by some, by random, some random, random, by some random, random linear, linear method. Map. Yes, exactly. Okay, thank you. Which is coupled to both of them in some sense, right? So there is a coupling with the random linear map, which makes them isomorphic. Yes, I think this is what was what 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 was what was proved here. Mm, and now we can. So I'm just trying to describe what 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 will be done in the next lecture. So uh, if we have a polytop and we want to compute the number of faces of its projection, then we can take all faces here and look whether they survive under such a projection. And the condition of surviving is very similar. So if I have a face here and I project it into a random direction, but now it's, it's not a direction, it's now a direct, it's a subspace, which is a direction. Then we can try to relate this to the so-called Grassmann angles. And one can express the expect f vectors through the Grassmann angles. So in the next lecture, I will try to introduce the Grassmann angles and many notions related to them. For example, the conic intrinsic volumes, which are the conic versions of the usual intrinsic volumes. And all these notions turn out to be, I think, rather interesting. And they appear not only in such problems of computing projections, but in many other problems. I think at this point we have to stop. I know that it's a little bit too early, but I didn't know that it will be so quick. So that giving a lecture using, the, using this device is so quick. So I, I hope we can stop here. <laughs>